move into Word. And obviously he's an apprentice who's working on the Word and his name happens to be Word, which is brilliant. And then we've got in the green outfit, we've got William uh, Caxton, who bought the first printing press to Westminster Abbey. Mm-hmm. And then when the station has fallen, it was then taken by Wigan de Word to Fleet Street, and then Wigan de Word became known as the, I suppose, the, the, the master of Fleet Street, ultimately. So it's a really great story of how yeah. apprentices have gone from, you know, journeymen to masters, and then how that whole cycle... But it's a link in history. But it is a link in history. It isn't always talking about it. It isn't. Obviously, friendships go all the way back to medieval time. Yeah. Here we are today talking about National Friendship Week. Friendship, so... Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. To start this conversation with you, I mean, what when you think about apprenticeships, in a couple of sentences, what do you value most about them? Well, I, I do see apprenticeships as a bit like a gold standard for learning because you have the opportunity to be learning on the job as well as learning outside of the job and being able to reflect. And with the opportunities that we have for apprenticeships, I also believe that it's a really important part of achieving social justice, of helping grow our economy and making sure that there's those different opportunities for young people to learn. No, absolutely. And again, I I keep coming back to this heritage and craft point. Because, I mean, if you think back over the times, you know, was probably a limit to what you could do an apprenticeship in at different points. Whereas now today, I mean, you can do apprenticeships in probably over 600 different occupations, you know, right down to becoming a chocolatier. You can even now learn how to be an airline pilot doing an apprenticeship, as well as obviously, you know, construction and engineering and so on. So the choice that's out there now is just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, it, look, it is um, a sign of how the economy has changed, about how things have moved on. I mean, there wouldn't have been aeroplanes in the time that, that uh, apprenticeships were starting in the medieval times, as we were discussing, and how they've evolved through the centuries. I think there's been a really important principle though which is about learning from those who are masters of their and you know leaders of their Mm. crafts and to really be embedded in that sort of enjoyment of learning but developing a practice about which you can then be proud and there's that really important part of identity associating with what you can do what you're achieving and what role you're playing in the economy uh, and in society and you're absolutely right there's a there's so much choice now it's a test I think to the way we've seen the development of apprenticeships, the working with employers, the way government must work uh, with industry as well, but to create those pathways in so that there can be access to those jobs and those employment opportunities for people of all backgrounds and in all ways and having that opportunity to learn while studying, which is a a different kind of choice and one that suits uh, pe- some people a lot more. Yeah, of course it does. And, and of course, it's interesting you bring in choice because I think that is what's so important for young people, that they have some choice and they're not forced into some kind of binary um, route that might not be right for them. And, you know, we speak to so many young people and adults alike who who recognise that apprenticeships gives them that choice. And you said something a moment ago, I think it's really important. It's that opportunity to keep learning and progressing and then learning some more and then keep progressing in a way that I think is at an advantage to some of the more traditional academic routes that that, that some people take. And of course, your title is is, is of Shadow Minister for Skills and FE, so that's a pretty big portfolio to cover. And I suppose what I'm interested in is, where do you see, therefore, the opportunities for the joins, rather than looking at each one of those as very separate? How do we create a much more joined up skill system? Because we don't have that right now. Well, I think one of the great opportunities is to see FE colleges as so pivotal in the local economy and in the leadership that learning in the FE, in FE colleges can contribute to local prosperity and opportunity. It's one of the reasons why we see technical excellence colleges as playing an important part in the mix of the future where you can have an FE college that maybe uh, is able to take uh, the lead with other players, employers, uh, HE and other Uh, others involved in the local economy, uh, schools as well, um, to be able to look at where there can be specialisms Mm. that can be particular for that local economy and then create those greater opportunities in more depth with more resource that can meet local skills needs. I think what people want to see and when the investment is made by you know young people particularly in apprenticeships and the higher standards that they also want to see, uh, the qualifications have to have the confidence of the people taking them 
mm. but also of parents and others that there'll be a job at the end of it and they can yep. see where that's going. That's what also contributes to learning and joining up pathways. And I think what will be important, and I'm sure we'll discuss it further, through the work that we've talked about with Skills England, a new national body that will mm -hmm. oversee a national skills strategy, perhaps for the first time in so long in the UK, that it will be an opportunity to think about how do we join up the skills opportunities and pathways yes. so that there is much more of a seamless um, step out of perhaps education in school into uh, FE or um, colleges then on to, for some into HE, but there is an alignment and that alignment is one that makes it easier for the learner mm -hmm. and where you can see that you can make those choices to go into work or to further study. That's a really important yes. part of how we have a strategy that holds together for the nation. Yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, it's got to be about that output and destination. We've got to be able to have the aspiration leading to, to, to a destination. You mentioned, obviously, some of the critical actors uh, who, who operate in the system. You've talked about employers and colleges. Of course, there's also the private training provider market, you know, providers play a very big part, especially in the apprenticeship agenda. I mean, you'll have heard a lot about the fact that employers, whilst they, many of them are very committed to apprenticeships and skills generally, some of them are finding themselves having to turn away from, in inverted commas, the system because of the red, red tape, the bureaucracy. What do you think Labour's policy will be on really trying to flex up the levy, if I can use that term, and take away some of that bureaucracy and red tape that exists today? Well, there's a lot of challenges in there and for National Apprenticeship Week, and Apprenticeship Week, I do just want to pay tribute to all of those involved in delivering our apprenticeships across the country. Mm. And that is the colleges, the businesses, the training providers, uh, and even to pay tribute to those in our schools and colleges that really are signposting opportunities. Yes. We've got to see that part being played as well, the signposting of opportunity, whether that's through careers advice and support in our schools so that people understand the opportunities that are available to them. But you are absolutely right that there has been a real challenge with employer engagement and we've seen that in some of the statistics around the lack of completions of apprenticeships with some of the challenges that employers are also facing as well as learners, which really does need um, some, some deeper thinking and some mm. very important research with St Martin's Group uh, and others coming out quite recently. But I also think that we've got to recognise where the system isn't working. Yep. If you've seen a drop in 200,000 apprenticeships since the levy came in, if we've seen, the, you know, if you look at the calculations that the City, the city and Guilds have done, which was around three and a half billion of unspent apprenticeship levy in mm -hmm. the four years after the levy came in, if you've seen a plummeting of small and medium sized enterprises mm -hmm. engaged by property on 49% since 2016, engaging in apprenticeship there is something that isn't working mm -hmm. and it's really important that we look together you know, a, a, a government industry our providers uh, and uh, our um, qualification um, uh, bodies and so on to say what is it that's going yes. wrong because it's in nobody's interest that investment is made and those outcomes are not being achieved uh, by by our apprenticeship um, uh, and uh, apprentice, apprentices and other learners. What is what we want to see as well is there is greater flexibility. Yes. Uh, many companies um, uh, have called for flexibility. The growth in skills levy, which we have announced, would allow. Uh, up to 50% of the apprenticeships levy, if it's unspent, to be spent on courses more flexibly and training more flexibly. Right. We've got some more work to do on that and we're consulting and discussing that. But it is important that we recognise how that links into the work of Skills England, mm -hmm. for thinking how we have a national strategy, how we have a regional approach, how we work with our um, LSIPs and uh, work to devolve some of our budgets as well so decisions can be made closer to the ground. But all in all, it ties together so that there isn't confusion about what is needed from a national perspective and there's clarity over what's needed locally like grassroots we work together yeah. no no look i think that's very very helpful and i'm sure people will be very heartened to hear that and as you say at the end of the day national apprenticeship week is also about celebrating those who have already achieved and those who are going to go on and achieve but of course we want to and need to encourage many more into the pipeline and you've touched on a really important issue there that starts are down and particularly worrying 
in young people. And we know that it's young people where we've got the biggest problem with unemployment and certainly low skill, low pay jobs. So I think, you know, what is it specifically that you think, you know, Labour would really focus on to really address that issue in terms of having more flexibility in the levy or just generally even focusing, focusing much more of the apprenticeship spend on young people? Is that a direction you think Labour might look to take? Well, you've highlighted such an important issue and I will just make this final point on the, on the levy and what it could contribute and the work of Skills England and thinking about shorter, more modular mm -hmm. courses, more stackable courses. The reason why that's important is because it can also create more access to opportunity for learning because there are also uh, um, examples that has been shown in some of the research and evaluation of sometimes the courses might be too long yep. uh, for people serving circumstances or they may not be the appropriate learning opportunity and that there can be more targeted upskilling and reskilling through different ways of learning. But with young people this is a really core issue because we've got to get the foundations right for young people for their lives and it is um, so important that we see that investment. We have the aspiration that 80% of young people should be achieving a uh, level three Mm -hmm. um, equivalent uh, um, qualifications or achievements and it's really important that we have that so there's a strong foundation for them in terms of education uh, employment and training and that we see that target being met by 2020 uh, 2035 right with more young people than ever going into those positive pathways mm -hmm. with a strong sense of direction for themselves and their next steps and that's a real area of focus for us should we get into government okay. Okay, and that, that's really interesting actually because that, that takes me into a slightly different but related angle, which is the the conversation around qualifications reform. But but more importantly, because we want to keep this around national celebrating National Apprenticeship Week. But how important it is to have those pathways, and therefore the role of level two and level two qualifications as a stepping stone into that aspiration. I mean, what's your view on view on that, Seema, if I may? We recognise that's really really important, and I've heard that from so many people. I've heard that from our colleges, our providers, I've heard that from businesses, I've heard that from young people themselves. And it is going to be critical that we don't see the ladder pulled away yeah. from young people who have got those opportunities to access those then higher level qualifications and to have the chance to try something that maybe they didn't have the opportunity yes. to do before or who maybe didn't really settle in education in school for whatever reason that might have been, who have the chance to go into and do level two qualifications and then lead on to level three and then into whichever pathways they then choose. It's one of the reasons why we have said that we would pause and review the defunding uh, of BTEX and that we would want to make sure that we've got clarity yes. over what is happening yeah. and that we don't pull those pathway um, opportunities good. away. No, that's really good to hear and I'm sure people will be uh, very heartened to hear that and of course it isn't just BTEX, it's generally level twos it's uh, all, all over. Well look, going back to the, the idea of celebration and imagining you know, when we were starting our careers and had there been the variety of apprenticeships, I often think about this myself, had there been the variety of friendships that exist today back then, what might I have chosen? Have you ever thought what you might have chosen to have done the friendship in SEMA? Well, you know, that's really interesting. I, um, I don't know, but one of the things I am interested in is, is jewellery making. Oh, so, right. Okay. So I don't know if it would have been something Interesting. That. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah. Um, but you know, you see, I still see now when you see um, some uh, small businesses. Yes. You see uh, men and women who might be creating things, and that you, you see, you know, really, I, I it always catches me when I see really beautiful jewellery. Yeah. That people have made them really start started that from yes. scratch, yeah, and they yeah, from scratch, they've had that imagination, and then people go and wear that, and they're sort of wearing that art. Yeah. Um, when when they're yeah, really passing on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's exactly brilliant. That. And you know, through COVID, I know there was. Um, um, there was a, a young person, a teenager, who was uh, the daughter of an MP, in fact, who um, decided to make jewellery. And, you know, it was so beautiful that we were all buying it. Obviously. Right. You know, Brilliant. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah. So and actually, and the great news is you, you could today go and do, you could even now go and do an apprenticeship at the goldsmiths uh, around the corner from here.
And, and you know, and, and, and there are some amazing apprenticeships in, in craft and jewellery and, and, and the arts. The issue, of course, coming back to a slightly more serious, sobering point is so many of them now aren't getting the funding and therefore those paths are being closed off. And I think that is another challenge that might be worth you just giving a quick reflection on how do we, you know, we know the pot is quite small, but we don't want to lose sight of those really important crafts that are not just his heritage, they are about today and tomorrow. So I think anything that, you know, that you might be thinking around about how do you actually ensure that crafts aren't missed out in the uh, in the playing field would I think be tremendously helpful I don't know if you have a perspective on that this is where government needs to have a vision it has to have a vision across the board because how do all of these things join up and how do we look towards a nation and our future where we are proud of our heritage but creating a tomorrow yes. that we're all really proud of and we know that art and culture and heritage plays a huge role in our well-being in our well-being as citizens our well-being of our communities, our well-being of our nation and our pride in our heritage. That's why I'm so pleased that we have such a champion for arts, for culture and for heritage in our shadow culture secretary, Thangam Debonair, herself a classical musician. And her vision that she's outlined, which is looking to how we preserve and support art and culture and heritage in all of our communities, whether that's ceramics in Staffordshire or is, you know, to the goldsmiths in, in the city, that there is part of a vision of our economy yeah. as well that takes in totally. that heritage and art because it is connected, mm. it is connected. And within that, thinking about how we build a curriculum in school that is focusing and draws in um, uh, aspects of art and heritage and culture, builds that sense of connection with that learning and then contributes to